Fifty years in religious life. Fifty years in religious life. That's why we find the, the difference between now, then and now. <coughs> that time, excuse me, to get from Sirukunda to here, it took about two hours. And we had to come by, by tan in behind Tanji, and there was a little a timber bridge, sticks going across <laughs> a swamp. That's where we came. Now we have a lovely highway. We get out here to Rukunda 20 minutes. But that was at least two hours. By vehicle? By vehicle, yeah. Okay. There was, Kunkudang consisted of about 10 grass huts. And um, full of sickness, most of the children dying before the age of five, 75% before the age of five. So to counteract that, I started a small clinic with the help of Sister Anne Marie Murphy of the St. Joseph of Cluny Sisters. Then, because of the vermin and snakes and rats in the grass huts, we began a housing scheme here in Kunkujang. Mm -hmm. We would get the people to pay 400 dialysis for the blocks, then I would have a mason build a house, I'd find the palm runs and the corrugates, and up to now, we have now, we built about maybe over a hundred houses like that in Kunkudang. So the people weren't living here, but at that time, the commissioner in Brikhama put out an edict that all those Manjagos living in the bush, not in a, a concentrated village, should go back to Guinea-Bissau. And Kunkudang was picked as the center for the Mandiagos in this area, if they wanted to stay in Gambia, they stay here in Kunkudang or they get out. And as evidence of that, up near their school, in the nursery school, primary school, there was a well that the area council dug, and on the well, 1975 is written on the well. So that tells you the history of Kunkudang goes back to then. Since then, education has been the predominant thing over the years for me here in Kumbayang. 50 years in religious life. 50 years in religious life. The first person was the late member of parliament's father, who was the Aikali at that time. We used to call him Lawrence Mendy. We used to call him Lawrence Mput Mendy. That's Paul's father. Okay. And he made me very, very welcome because before I had come here, Father Carroll from Kartang used to come around this area a little bit. But he found the Manjagos were unreliable and uh, he just couldn't manage them. So he was the first man in Kunkujang. He built a little church down the far of Kunku. He brought cement to build a church. And the people down there used mud instead of cement plaster. So the church fell down and Father Carroll said bye-bye to the Manjagos in this area. So then I came in then and I had to continue on his work. 50 years in religious life. 50 years in religious life. The challenge coming to Mandiago country was uh, to learn the language. Mandiago, and you know, a very, very difficult language was nothing written in it. So what I did was, I had a small tape recorder. I get somebody, Paul Mindy's sister it was, to uh, translate, this is a cat, the cat is on the table, into Manjago. And I did in primary one book, up as far as primary six book, on the tape recorder, translated like that. And in that way, I got the foundation of the Manjago language. When I had that then, that gave me a good start off into the work among the people. My first mass in Kungujang was on a Sunday after I finished Mass in, in Canifin. We made an altar with five or six sticks and two sticks standing up, a little platform of an altar. Mm -hmm. I said Mass there. I had two adults, five children, and the collection was five sour oranges. That was the first Mass that was ever said in Kunkujang. And uh, that's the beginning. But the Spirit of the Lord was here. And I know now, and probably most people know, that I was called here for a purpose. We're all given a purpose. We don't know that the time, we all have a function in life, God picks us for some particular work. And seemingly, 
This is the work he push, pushed me into among the Manjagos. 50 years in religious life. 50 years in religious life. I feel I'm not as fit as I used to be, but um, I'm here living in Kunkujang among the people I knew, I have known for the last 50 years. Most of the young people now are children of the people I first baptized here. And uh, the deep respect that the people have for me here is so touching that I have lived uh, so many years with these people. And they have lived so many years with me, with some, some such simplicity and no nonsense. And to have that is a gift from God. To have so many years with the people, to know them, to love them. They love you. They have their own way of saying thank you. And it's not the way normal, normal people say thank you, but the people here have their own special way, and they're going to show that on the feast of my golden jubilee on the 1st of March. We will see it then. I will remember it as the home of the biggest Uchai in the Gambia. <laughs> we had the biggest Juju woman in Gambia living in Kunkujang. May she rest in perfect peace. There's a lovely story about her. She was a stepmother of Paul, the late Paul, and member of parliament. Beautiful woman. And uh, Seemingly, we became friends very early on, even though I was opposed to the juju. And she did catechism. And when the time came for her to make the second catechumen, at that time we did the catechumen by steps. I leave the devil all his works and his promises. He said, Father, I'm sorry, I'm not ready yet. And she left the group five years afterwards. We were doing the catechumen again, and that lady came up, Father, I'm ready now. And I baptized her there and then. And she left her low chai and all the things behind her, and died a most holy and beautiful death. That's what they remember most of all, is the fighting with the juju, and you, you could say almost winning the battle. Not completely, but almost. Fifty years in religious life. 50 years in religious life. Uh, get up early in the morning, good early start, say my mass, say meditation. I have the day free then. I do a lot more prayers than I used to because I have more time to pray now, meditation. I do a lot of walking in the bush. I have a beautiful adoration chapel over there. You should see it. Have a look at this beautiful. And I spend a lot of time there. I read, I listen to good music. And that's the way I pass my time here. A lovely, simple way of passing time. I've, there's no boredom, no hardship attached to that. And I have a very good cook who looks after me well. And some lovely children around me as well. So nobody could have a better time than I. And I just wish that priest would end up in the same happy position as I am in today. It's so beautiful to have a retirement in good health. The main thing is to have good health. To be given the gift of good health to the end. I'm not stumbling around yet. Maybe by my diamond jubilee, I'll be going around with a stick and dark glasses, but at the moment, I'm fine. State then, from the beginning, the Gambian state has helped us here in Kunkujang. Kunkujang was, was nothing at the beginning, 10 grass huts. Now it's a big town. I call it town. I call Tujuring, uh, Tujuring nearby, I call it village. I say, Tujuring village, Kunkujang town. They don't like that, but never mind. But the government helped us to build the schools here with a high secondary school here, very high standard of education. At one stage they helped to build a clinic here. And after the when President Jamie, before he became president as head of state, he personally told the leader of the immigration group to give Father Sharp a Gambian passport. The next morning, I went to the immigration office and got a Gambian passport to the, to the, to the, to the, to the lovely help of the now President Jamil. He told, give Father Sharp a passport, and I got it the next day. That's a beautiful relationship to have with anybody like that. On many occasions, when the President was going around on tour, I always spoke at his meetings, I gave a blessing. And on one occasion in Sanyang, the protocol man 
wanted to stop me. I was speaking too much. 